Let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing. Now, Father, bless our time together tonight. Open our minds and hearts. Uh, and there's people here that uh, need some help desperately. And I pray that we might be able to help them. And uh, if you'll open their hearts or if they'll open their hearts, then uh, your will be done. I pray this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians 10 was written by the Apostle Paul. And for those of you who don't know, 1 Corinthians was a letter written to a group of people in Corinth called the Corinthians. And uh, this particular letter deals with all kinds of issues that they were having, trying to help them to understand how to conquer their issues. And uh, the, the scripture talk starts out here by saying that uh, there's a group that you should pay attention to, and he talks about Moses, which was 1,500 years prior to this. Now, these people in Corinth may not have known about Moses because they were Gentiles, and Moses, of course, was of the line of Abraham, and, uh, or Jewish. And at that particular point, they had the scripture, and they might have known, but who knows if they knew or not. But what he was saying to them is that the scripture that was recorded going all the way back to Moses was written for our instruction or for their instruction. If it was written for their instruction, it's written for our instruction. And he's saying, you know, you got to watch out for certain things. And if you want to know how God deals with people, you look at what happened to Moses and uh, what happened to the, the people of his day. And Moses, of course, was God's man and God's leader. And God had appointed him to lead the children of Israel. And if you know this, that uh, they were delivered out of Egypt. And they had been captive in Egypt. Anybody know how long? Oh, my star. There's a, give that guy a gold star back there, you know. 430 years, they were held captive in Egypt. Now, 430 years is a long time ago. If you take our country right now and go back 430 years, where does that take us? Oh, man, they are just getting off the boat just about, right? So a lot of history, and these people were held in slavery in a land, and the, that's all they knew was being in slavery. All they knew was being a part of this culture. They didn't have their own culture, hardly. They were used to the... Uh, food of Egypt and the ways of Egypt and all of that. Well, they started crying because uh, they were being enslaved and, and it was more of a burden than they could carry. And, and it was, they were starting to get desperate. And so they began to pray and God raised up Moses and sent Moses in to deliver them. So they left the land. You remember the big contest that they had with Pharaoh and, and all the, uh, all the, all the uh, miracles that were performed and the things that happened and trying to convince Pharaoh that he ought to let the people go. Finally, he did. Out they went and uh, out into the wilderness they went and they were heading back to the promised land, which should have been maybe a 90-day journey, something like that. Not too long. You could get there. And uh, instead, they, uh, you know, they didn't like the wilderness. So we're we're kind of used to the way of the world, you know. We, we have our own style. It's behind us, and, and I'm used to that kind of living. I'm just I'm talking to you here now. We get used to that kind of living, and they couldn't stand freedom. They had been delivered and couldn't stand deliverance. So here they are out in the wilderness, and they started griping and complaining, and they, uh, they fell into idolatry, it says here in verse 7, and sexual sins in verse number 8, and it says you shouldn't do that in verse number 9, and it says in verse number 10, they murmured among themselves, and they, they were destroyed of the destroyer. So God didn't like that. So here's what we should know about that. This is an example to us to show us how God deals with certain lifestyle issues. He doesn't like people that are idolatrous. He doesn't like things that are, and he's never changed his attitude about sin. The only caveat that there is in the New Testament is that Jesus died for your sins. He paid for your sins, which is an awesome caveat when you get right down to it, but he still 
God still hasn't changed his attitude about sin. He did, however, say that, um, that uh, there is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Everybody gets tempted, right? Everybody, you ever get tempted? I, I, I'm in the, I think I hit the mother load of temptation right here, you know. So. <clears throat> he says, there is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, it says, and will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you can be able to bear it. So do you know what that means? You don't have to give in. You, you don't, it's not required. You're not compelled to give in. You get tempted and it says, you don't have to. Why is that? Because God makes a way of escape. Now, I don't think the world gives you a way of escape. I don't think Egypt gave them a way of escape. Egypt kept them in bondage. But God makes a way of escape. And he goes on to say, he says, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. He says, and I speak as to wise men saying, I hope you get it. Some of you will. Some of you won't. So the whole idea here of this, uh, this uh, message is to say, we can learn how God deals with things by looking at the Old Testament. We can go all the way back and there's an example of what we should or should not do and, and what God thinks about it. So, all that said, I want to bring up an Old Testament guy that this would be not quite 1,500 years, maybe only half that uh, back in time, into the book of Daniel. So if you've got a Bible, open it to the book of Daniel. We're going to check out one particular guy and uh, talk about him tonight. And this is a guy who's a king, and his name is Nebuchadnezzar. Can you say that with me? Nebuchadnezzar. That's hard to say, isn't it? Can anybody spell it? All right, never mind. All right, so me, me either. So here's what happened in the book of Daniel. I'm going to start by looking in uh, chapter number one. Here's what happened. The nation of Israel had fallen into idolatry. Do you know what that means, idolatry? Worshiping idol gods. And worshiping idol gods. So what is an idol god? Uh, what, uh, if, well, let me give a definition of idolatry. It's whatever goes on in your head that occupies most of your thinking. It could be that. It could be drugs. Who said cell phone? It could be money. It could be anything that occupies you above God. And he, God said, I don't like that kind of living. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let the nation go into captivity because of that. They don't seem to get it. I don't, I, I'm tired of this. I'm going to let them go off. And so here's what happened. This king of Babylon, his name was Nebuchadnezzar. Say that. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, that's, he said he allowed this king to come in and take them <clears throat> captive. Most of them were killed, frankly. And only a few of the cream of the crop were taken captive. Uh, guys like Daniel was taken captive. We know there was a priest named Ezra that was taken captive. Nehemiah probably because he's the one that was allowed to go back and actually build a wall up. Uh, maybe uh, we, their Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These are the guys that were thrown into the fiery furnace. Remember that? And this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, was the king over all that. So here's what happened. They tried to change the diet. We want you to eat the Babylonian style. They tried to change their physical appetites. And, the, and Daniel and his boys said, you know what? I don't want to do that, man. I want, I want to, uh, 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 that's against God. I, want, I don't want to do things that are against God. I have a certain vow with God. I want to eat a certain way. I want to eat his way. And, uh, and they said, no, 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 it's required of you. And Daniel made a little deal. He said, look. I'm going to eat the way I'm supposed to eat. And you come back in a little while and see if I'm healthier than the rest of the guys that didn't. And they said, okay, you can go. And so he did that. And he, he said this. I loved what he said. And Daniel, here's what he said, purposed, and then in verse 8, chapter 1, he purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So I like the idea. Here's what it is. You ready? He purposed in his heart. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to eat that kind of food. I'm certainly not going to drink the wine. And I'm just not going there. I'm not going there. So how does that happen? It has to happen in here, doesn't it? I mean, it's got to be a determination that says, I'm not doing that. And I know the temptation, but God says there's no temptation taking you, but it's such as common to man, and, and God is faithful and will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. So you don't have to do it, that's what I'm saying. So Daniel purposed in his heart he wouldn't do it. So after a, a little bit of time, the king uh, 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 had a dream. And the king, and I don't know why, but for some reason, uh, God deals with people in dreams sometimes. I know that in the Middle East right now, in the Muslim world, God is doing a lot with dreams. And he's waking people up for some reason. And he's, Jesus is actually showing up in dreams. And uh, the entire Muslim world's having dreams. And, uh, and what's going on is the, uh, the, uh, the Muslim um, uh, 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 pastors, what's the word I'm looking for? Imams are saying, oh, no, here's who's showing up. It, it, it's Muhammad that's showing up. And, uh, but it's not, and they know it's not. It's Jesus that's showing up. Well, this king had a dream. I don't know why, but he had a dream. And uh, so God gave the king this dream, and then it troubled him all night long. He couldn't sleep. He's laying there in bed, tossing around. And he called his magicians and his supernatural guys that ought to be able to interpret dreams. He said, you know what, guys, I want you to come in. He said, I had a dream last night. He said, it bothered me. I couldn't sleep all night, but I can't remember what the stinking dream was. He says, so if you guys are really supernatural, you ought to be able to not only tell me the dream, but you ought to be able to tell me the interpretation. And if you don't, then you're phonies. And so they started making up stuff, and he said, oh, man, we, how, how are we going to interpret a dream? You won't even tell us a dream? He said, all right, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you all killed. So he started killing them, and Daniel said, wait a minute, I'm not one of them. He said, I'm different. He said, uh, I, I know God, and I can, uh, I can get this done for you. So he said, all right, I want you to tell me what the dream was, and I want you to tell me what the interpretation was. So what do you think Daniel did? Great. You better believe it, man. His, his life is on the line. He's about to pray. So here's what his prayer was, and he said, uh, he said, Daniel went to his house, and he made the thing known to those guys, and he said that, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, and Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon, and they began to pray, and Daniel said, oh God, you, you. so he prayed this awesome prayer, and said, I, I need some help, now I've got my life on the line, I need some help. And I need some wisdom on how to answer this prayer. And God gave it to him. That's cool. Can God do that? Yes. Anytime he feels like it, right? Could he do it then? Yes. Can he do it now? Can God deliver you out of your... If not, he's not God. So... Daniel got before the king and he interpreted for him and uh, he told him what the secret was and the king said, you're one smart dude. He said, in fact, I, and what he was telling him was world history in advance. And I'm not going to go into all the images that he saw and all the dream that he saw, but what he did was he talked about the Roman Empire and the Medes and the Persians that didn't exist yet and the, and the Greek Empire and, the Ro and all of that. And he talked about all that in advance of their actually being there. And uh, so the, the, king, the king came up. He said, then the king Nebuchadnezzar, I'm in chapter 2 and verse 46, he fell upon his face and he worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors. And the king answered to Daniel and said, of a truth, 
It is your God. He's the God of God, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. And the king made Daniel a great man because of it. Well, the king got, he got the solution right. Your God is God. All this other stuff that's been going on. And he said, I, I, I'm humbling my, I acknowledge that. Your God is God. And that's a pretty good place to be, don't you think? Well, he didn't arrive yet. So here's what happened. The next chapter, this king says, but I'm pretty important too. In fact, I'm so important. And he started believing his critics, you know, oh, king, live forever. You're awesome, and you're, you're all there is. And he said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. And he, he had the people make a statue. And they made a statue of him. I mean, it was ginormous. That's what it says in the Hebrew, ginormous. It was ginormous. <laughs> And uh, so he said, all right, not only do I like the statue, but here's what I want you to do. I want everybody in here to bow down to this statue because this represents me and I am the man. Now, you know, here's, here's what I'm saying. Can, have you ever gotten to the place where you thought that the world revolved around you and nothing really mattered except what was going on in your life and who cares about everything else. I don't care about my family. It's all about me. I want to be numero uno. That's what they say in Mexico. I want to be numero uno. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It said, let's make the English language numero uno. And I thought, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Bill got that. All right. <laughs> And I think that that's probably one of the sins that brought you here. It's all about me. I don't care about anything. I don't care what it cost. I don't care what it cost my family. I don't care what it cost those that love me. I don't care what it cost the, if it cost me my job. I don't care if it cost me my home. This is where I am, and it's all about me. Now, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, that's probably what happened to Eve. Because Satan came along, and by the way, Satan does come along, and he knows your weakness. I, I mean, he, and it may not be your weakness today, but tomorrow, you know. Yeah, I'm strong, I'm strong. Well, but how about tomorrow? So I think he kind of circles overhead like a vulture, just waiting until you have a moment of weakness or a moment of self-pity or a moment of I'm all that. And he said to Eve, you know, you're not going to die. And, you know, God knows that. And she said, yeah, why does this always have to be about God? Why can't this be about me? And I think that's the overarching sin of the human race. Why can't this be about me? Why do I care about anybody else but me? So this guy built a statue. And he loved himself so much that he says, here's what I want you to do. I want everybody here to bow down to this statue. In fact, if you don't bow down to this statue, I'm going to have you killed. So these guys, these uh, monotheistic Jews said, we're not doing that, man. That's idolatry. That's what got us kicked out of our country. That's what got us taken off into captivity. Well, I mean, we know better than this. We're not going to do this. All right, everybody bows down. And here's these three guys standing in the back going, yeah, we're not doing that. Oh, man, somebody get those guys and let's go throw them in the fiery furnace. Now, I don't know how this... It says that it was made seven times hotter than ever before. Now, how do you measure that? I don't know that. I mean, it was hot enough to burn, but we're going to make it seven times hotter than that. And I, I don't know what the calculation is. All I know is it said that the, guy, the, the guys that threw him in the furnace burned up throwing them in the furnace. Well, I don't know if I'd do that if I was a... I mean, what's, what's your fear? You're gonna, somebody going to kill you? So I'm, what else you got, you know? And we know what happened when they got in the fiery furnace, do you not? They said, we're not going to bow. Verse 17 of chapter 3, 
if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto the king that we will not serve your gods. We don't care what the price is. If God delivers us, that's cool. If God doesn't deliver us, that's okay. We're going to take it. So they got thrown into the fiery furnace and they didn't die. In fact, this king, he, he, he was concerned about it and he peeked inside and he said, you know, I threw three guys in there in verse 25. He says, but I see the fourth man loose and they're walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. He said, in the form of the fourth man is like unto the son of God. Four guys said, how did that happen? What's going on? <laughs> now, I've never heard of that happening since then. I mean, that's a one-time deal, right? But it does tell me something about God. He can deliver you out of anything. He can deliver you out of anything. If you just take that stand and say, you know, I don't care. I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to bow. I'm not giving in. Because there's no temptation taken you but such as common to man. And God is faithful and will with every temptation make a way of escape that you can be able to bear it. Every temptation. That means you don't have to commit any sin. None. Well, our king couldn't get it right. He recognized the God of Daniel. He's standing here at the fiery furnace. He sees something supernatural going on, but he still can't help himself. He still thinks, I'm all that. Look at all these people bowing down to me. He didn't know it was because they were afraid. He thought they were, adored him. Oh, my. So God said it's time for another dream, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to have another dream. You're not going to like this one. So he gave him another dream. And he said to Daniel, you know, I know you're the guy that interprets dreams. And he said, please interpret this dream. And the, the, Daniel said, this one might be scary because it might cost me something. He said, but I'm going to tell you the interpretation of the dream. I, I, I saw you losing your kingdom. They they drove you out like an animal. <coughs> he said, you, you started eating grass like an oxen. You had dew on you because you were outside. And he said, your, your nails grew and, and, and you got your hair turned into feathers and, and you lost your mind for a while. I don't know about the feathers and the, and the nails. I'm just saying some of you guys landed in that spot. Did you not? Somebody had to drag me off the curb because I had fallen down and hurt myself. I mean, you lost your mind. And he said, that's what I saw happening to you, king. And uh, the king said, I, I don't, why would you say this to me? And he said, he said this, he said, um, uh, verse 25, and they shall drive you from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall eat or make you eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you till you know, listen to this, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. That's your problem, Nebuchadnezzar. You don't know who's boss. You think you're in charge. You do know you're not in charge, right? Oh, yeah. You, you got that figured out, do you? You do know you can't even get up in the morning unless God lets you, right? Your next breath came from God. You know that, don't you? So that feel your pulse, you got one? Just thank God for it. He's in charge. And he said, here's the reason this is happening to you, because you don't know. 
And jumping down to verse 33, and it says, here's the deal. The same hour was the thing fulfilled unto Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men. He did eat grass as the ox. And I'm in chapter 4, verse 33. And his body was wet with the dew from heaven till his hair was grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, listen to this, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I said, blessed be the most high. And I praised and honored him. Uh, Do you see what's going on here? These things were given to us for example so that we can know what God's trying to do with us. God's trying to deliver you. God's trying to help you. God's trying to bless you. But he's not going to let you be all that. He doesn't get the credit. He wants you to say, praise God. He wants you to say, amen. He wants to be involved. He wants people to know he's involved. And when you do that, you know. So guess what happened? (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar finally passed off the scene. He died, right? Had a son. Now, wouldn't you think his son would have watched all this and said, you know what, I see what's happening to dad. That'll never happen to me. Wouldn't you think? I'll never do that. Wouldn't you think? I saw him up. I saw him down. I saw God knock him down. I saw God lift him up. I mean, I'm going to say something. I I, I believe in God. I believe. I saw it happen to my dad. Yeah, he didn't do that. His name was Belshazzar. Guess what he did? Chapter 5. Listen to this. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords, and he drank wine before the thousands. Now, that's probably off to a bad start. You know what I mean. But you can handle just one. (laughs) Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. So he stole these articles from the holy place of God, took all the gold and the silver that was in the temple of God, and he took it out and said, you know what, we're having fun drinking, but you know, I just want to kind of rub God's nose in this. Bring out those vessels. Let's fill them full of wine. Let's drink out of those. (laughs) I'm just saying, have you lost your mind? I I mean, some people are just stuck on stupid, you know. This guy wouldn't learn. That's a bad place to be, isn't it? This guy wouldn't learn. I mean, some things you got to learn, don't you think? He wouldn't learn. And here's what I think. That maybe here's a little phrase you might like this. No wine in God's vessels. You know what God's vessels are? Mmm. Yeah, but some people can handle it. Some people, no, 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 no. Yeah, but just one, I mean, what's it? No, 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 no. There's never been an alcoholic ever in the history of the world that didn't take his first drink. I mean, how many times do you want the snake to bite you before you say, that? this isn't good? And you know why Satan wants you to do that? Because he can't get you to go lay on a railroad track when a train comes. You're too smart for that. (laughs) Well, guess what happened? While they were drinking in the (laughs) same... In the same hour, it says in 5 and 5, came forth... uh, 
fingers of a man's hand and he wrote over against the wall. So all we have showing up is a, a hand, right? That's all. And it says that when he saw that, that his knees knocked together. Well, I should think so. You know, that, that ought to wake a person up, don't you think? And it says you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. So I asked myself, what would Nebuchadnezzar do? He would think, I'm all that. I don't care about anybody else, just me. And you'd think his son would learn, would you not? What will his son do? He'll rub God's nose in it. His daddy tried to exalt himself above God, and this guy said, I'm going to desecrate God's vessels. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, this is going to be all about me and God. I got this going on. So that's what he did. Now the next question is, well, what will you do? We saw what they did. Uh, here's what I think. I think it's a bad idea to oppose God, don't you? You agree with that? It doesn't turn out good. Let me read a poem for you. This is called Vindictus. Invictus. You heard the, anybody know this poem? This guy is tormented. Listen to this poem. He knows some scripture. Right? It sounds like he's had an experience somewhere. But listen to it. And, and I'm, it's from uh, William Henley. Listen to the poem. See if you can pick out those points. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. Thanks. Sounds tormented, doesn't he? Yeah. Something happened to this guy. I don't know what. But did you know the bottom line is you really are the captain of your own soul. It sounds like this guy had his head bloodied by God trying to get him to bow it. Wouldn't bow his head. Wouldn't bend. Nebuchadnezzar, oh, no, not him. Belshazzar, no, not these guys. Not these guys. Well, these things are written for our examples so that we can know how God operates. Nebuchadnezzar did the wrong thing. He opposed God. His son did the wrong thing. He fought God. This guy's unbloodied soul is hanging in the balance. And so is yours. Since you're the captain of your own soul, what are you going to do with it? going to waste it. Here's what I think. It's experiences like this that drive you to God. Don't fight him. You have to yield. You have to give in. You have to say to him, oh man, I... I 
I need you for sure. Yeah, but I'm pretty strong. I can get by. No, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. The help you need is supernatural. And you can't get it from somebody else. You have to get it from God. You with me? So here's how we do that. We're going to pray in a second. And when we do, we're going to all sort of ask God to be in control of us. We're going to tell him that I yield to you. I give up. I give in. And I don't think that's a one-time deal. I think you can do that over and over again. I think maybe once an hour. Keep you out of trouble. I'm serious. You with me? Let's bow our heads and pray. Now, Father, I pray that you'll bless every person in here and help them, Lord, to understand the, the gravity of the moment. And, Lord, I pray that by your power and by your might that you will conquer some hearts tonight and conquer some souls. While our heads are bowed and we're not looking, I'm going to help you with a prayer, and here's the way it goes. And just pray right along with me, will you? But the thing you've got to know about prayer, it's got to be sincere. It won't, it won't matter if it's not sincere. You ready? It goes like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sins. And the best I know how, I accept Jesus as my Savior. I yield to your will. I need you in my life. I need you in my heart. I need help with my addiction. Help me conquer the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been saying for a while that we're trying to put together something called vocational church, remember? And um, hold on.